So you'll notice as we open up chapter 6, verse 1, it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom, and over these three presidents of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them and the king should have no damage. Daniel is the number two guy in in control of power here. Sounds like Joseph of Egypt. Sounds who a also lot. knew how to interpret dreams. Exactly. There's there's a definite corollary going on here. So these these presidents who are interested in power, which by the way is a re-echo from the pre-mortal realm of Lucifer's only desire, which was to have that plot power and glory be all his. He he couldn't stand to share it with anybody else. That's what's going on here. So they want to trap Daniel. Look at their conclusion in verse 5. Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. He's, he's impeccable as far as his character and his honor and his integrity. We're, we're not going to be able to trap him unless we go after his religious beliefs. There we'll get him. So they, they have the king sign this decree from verse 7 that everyone is going to ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days save of thee, O king. Nobody's going to worship any other gods, make no other petitions of anybody but of thee, O king, because they, they see this, this human deification of their kings in that day. They, they see them as, as a god, so to speak. And so the king, there is, he signed that decree. That's great. People will honor me. God signed that any day, right? That's a good fallen human nature. And you'll notice verse 10, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed. So Daniel isn't going to go and break this decree in ignorance. He's going to break this decree knowing that he's breaking the decree, but he goes and he prays, kneeling upon his knees three times a day, giving thanks to God. They catch him in the act of praising his God, praying to his God, and he's brought before the king. Verse 14, these when the king heard these words, he was sore displeased with himself, and he set his heart on Daniel to deliver him, and he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. But there's this ancient tradition in these cultures that you can't go back on a law once it's established. You see that in the book of Esther, you see it in other places. So, verse 16, they commanded that Daniel be brought and cast into the den of lions, but notice what he says in the second half of verse 16. Notice the trust that Darius already has in Daniel and Daniel's God. Because Darius at this point, he realizes uh, he's been I've tricked. Been tricked. Uh, I, I let my own pride get in the way of making sure my kingdom is administered properly by wise and good people, and yet he can't go against his own decree because then suddenly people won't trust him as a king and it just puts problems here, but I love that he does say this. Now, now notice these words and see if they echo at all in your mind from something we just talked about back in chapter 3. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. You'll notice he didn't say, oh, Daniel, I sure hope your, your God is going to deliver you, or Daniel, I got a good feeling about this. I think your God's going to deliver you. Or, Daniel, pray for all your worth. I am so sorry. It's my bad, but uh, you've got to go. Good luck. He didn't say any of that. He said, Daniel, thy God whom thou worships, uh, wh whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. Here's a trial of faith for this, this non-Israelite king. He seems to be passing this trial of faith. <laughs> so, they lay the stone on the mouth of the den, king sealed it with his own signet, and notice verse 18, the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. He stays up all night, and he's pacing back and forth. He, he, the king rose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. When he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions? Did you notice what just happened? He didn't go and say, hey, Daniel, I know you're in there, so come on out. He goes there and he, he cries out in a lamentable voice, Daniel, is, is, 
did your God save you? I love that, that you can, you can have these expressions of absolute faith and trust from back in verse 16 and then move forward hoping and holding on to that, that, that belief that this is going to happen, but it's not an absolute assurance. It's that but-if-not principle yet again, this time happening for Darius. He's like, are you there? Are you okay? I think you're, you should be there. You should be okay. I love that, that it's, that your faith, it's okay. It's okay if you have questions. It's okay if everything isn't absolutely crystal clear to you today in your own struggles moving forward. It's okay if you, if you've had great expressions of faith in God, but now you're going through a trial and you're not sure absolutely of what the outcome is going to be. It's okay. Um, notice Daniel's response, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouths that they have not hurt me. And in verse 22 he says, my God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouths that they have not hurt me. I love that, uh, how that must have reaffirmed not just Daniel's trust and faith in God, but Darius's trust and faith in Daniel's God. And so the king commanded in verse 24 that the men who had set up this trap, they're the ones that get cast into the den of lions. And notice 26, I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, and steadfast forever in his kingdom that which shall not be uh, that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even unto the end." I love this, that, that Daniel's little trial of faith turns into Darius's trial of faith now then spreads to, to positively affect an entire kingdom. And I love that he concludes, he says, this is Darius. Now, again, this, the part of the purpose of these stories is to show how people living their truth that they get from God can influence other people to also see and accept the truth. And here's Darius, the king of the most powerful empire on earth at that time, saying, God delivereth and rescueth, and he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth, who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. And the story concludes, so this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. I want to tie this back into receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. When you receive that gift, every week at sacrament, you're invited to renew that covenant, to remember God at all times, and if so, you receive his presence with you. We've talked in other lessons that the word prosper in the, in the ancient Hebrew means to have God's Spirit with you. That's prospering. And so the conclusion here is ultimately, it's not about these spectacular miracles, that's interesting, but ultimately and fundamentally, it's can we prosper? by having God's Spirit with us. So most of us are not going to get cast in the lion's den, at least I hope not. But you can, on a weekly basis, prosper like Daniel by having God's Spirit with you, by fulfilling the promise you made at, sac at the sacrament table every week to always remember God. That's what Daniel did. He always remembered God. He trusted him. We can do the same. And if we do, we will have that prospering spirit.